What is up, the Heart Youth? Welcome to Eschatology 101. We talked last time about this idea of a meta narrative, meta narrative, the biggest story you're a part of. So, if we think of this specifically for the Bible, I think one illustration would be helpful. If we got in a helicopter and we rose to about 30,000 feet, you can't, you can't really go to 30,000 feet in a helicopter, can you? I think you'd like suffocate and die or something. Okay, well, so maybe not 30,000 feet, but like several thousand feet high, and, and, and you went around, right, and you were getting a survey of the land. You're, you're not gonna get to know every every leaf or, or stick or plant species, and a lot of the times we spend our time in the Bible browsing through passage by passage as if we were trying to walk the whole Appalachian mountain region, taking our time, looking at the flora and the fauna and trying to get a lay of the land. But sometimes we need to rise up to a a, a high view in order to to, to go pretty fast through the thing to get the big picture. Now, why are we doing this? This is at the service of eschatology. We're going to arrive there toward the end of our studies and the study is about the end. The end of the story doesn't really make sense unless we take a look at the beginning and the middle, right? If I just flipped to pick your favorite movie, like go ahead, your pop quiz, what's your favorite movie? If I pick that movie and I just play the last five minutes and I've never seen it before, I'm gonna be like, I I don't get it. Why does this movie mean so much to you? Because I will have no idea what that ending means without the beginning and the middle, the conflict, the drama, the the heroes. I want to do that for the Bible. If we started our eschatology one-on-one by simply looking at the end first, without a context of where and why that end is so important, well, I think we might miss some of the details. We talked a little bit about this image of a tapestry, right? The Bible is filled with so many different narrative threads, right? The idea of these narrative threads weaving together. It's almost like the biblical story is a bit like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. All of these narrative threads somehow working together for a big story. So as we browse through the Bible and we're reading a a riddle from Samson and a psalm from David and some poetry from a prophet and some legal material from Moses, and we're like, what is the big story? Just think Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's all gonna connect. I want to look at the meta narrative of the Bible, which is so big, through the lens of dwelling. Yes, I said lens. That's right, we're just gonna focus on this particular theme as it develops throughout scripture because there's a touch point at the beginning and at the end that I think you will be very intrigued by. And what do I mean by dwelling? Did you know that the Bible begins and ends with God living fully with his people? This is the story of dwelling. Genesis 1 and 2 paints a picture of God's original intent. He made a place for him and humanity to live together in the garden, the whole cosmos as his temple. And in that temple, he placed his images. This is part of our key identity as human beings were made in the very image and likeness of God. We were supposed to represent God to the world. And he told us to fill and multiply. In other words, God wanted the whole cosmos filled with people. He wanted to live with a big, big, big group of people that represented him. If this is where our story starts, well, we have to go through the rest of it to see where it goes, but we need to know this is part of God's intention for all of humanity. As we turn the chapter, we see that humanity indeed falls. In other words, they decided to determine what was good and evil for themselves, and this is a threat to God dwelling with his people. Indeed, he employs the first exile. He exiles Adam and Eve from the garden. Would God be able to dwell with people that didn't want to be with him? That's the question. Humanity deteriorates rapidly, and Cain kills his own brother. How could God live with the people who, instead of representing him, were representing something totally different. 
Indeed, these images of God weren't representing him. They were representing violent self-interest, filling and multiplying the world with something corrupt, something outside of God's goodness. What would God do to restore the relationship between him and his people? Could God live with a people who were bent on their own destruction? Since we're going through it at a helicopter speed, I'm going to conflate a couple of things. But here in Genesis chapter 12, we see that God will make a great nation out of Abram and his family. He wants to invite him to a place. That's where God's going to be. And this word blessing, he's going to bless the world through this family. That word blessing implies God's presence. So here we have the redemptive narrative taking shape and it really comes into a sharp fulfillment in Exodus chapter 19 where God invites the people to be with him. He wants Abraham's descendants to be a kingdom of priests. And the centerpiece of this kingdom of priests is, surprise, a re situation of the original temple. That's right, the tabernacle, this tent that they carried around in the wilderness, actually had imagery within it that represented the very Garden of Eden. God was back in the center of his people. God was dwelling with them, but it was mediated by a priesthood. A priest who would represent God more completely than those around him would be responsible for helping the people uh, return to this relationship of representing God. He would lead them in worship. He would lead them in sacrifice and the atonement for sins. All of this was God's way of inviting a whole people group back into dwelling with him more completely because in the presence of a holy God, a sinful people stands danger. So Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, a whole group of priests filling and multiplying the original idea of God's people group, filling the world with his presence. They were going to represent God and God was available. He had drawn near and this would change not just Israel, but the whole world. But much of the biblical narrative is the heartbreaking reality of Israel's failure. That the thing that God had envisioned, the people weren't doing it. They were living like Cain. They were living broken lives. And it threatened not only their relationship with each other, but their relationship with God and the promise of his dwelling. If the people that were supposed to represent that God was dwelling with them weren't representing God at all, what would God do? Israel had the global mission of proclaiming that God had drawn near to people once again, and their lives betrayed that truth. And here in Ezekiel, we have one of the most challenging scenes in all of the story of dwelling the theme of divine abandonment. God had his own temple destroyed after he left it. What would happen to the people who dwelled with God? While Ezekiel was in exile on the banks of the Kabar River in Babylonia, we have this interesting and pivotal moment in the history of God's people and the story of dwelling that God, while the temple was being destroyed, was promising a new one. While Ezekiel got a metaphorical blueprint, we see the New Testament sharpen this image a bit more dramatically. In fact, John says that Jesus tabernacled among us. That use of that word is implying that the fullness of God the presence, the dwelling of God was indeed Jesus Christ. No human priest could keep the people pure, and God himself became the priest. He dwelt among his people, the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. This sheds light on the story of dwelling when we really think about the Christmas story and the incarnation that the fullness of God came as a person, a human being who would represent God fully, fulfilling human identity. New Testament authors like Paul saw this, that we were the body of Christ, that we became 
the temple. Indeed, in the shadow of the cross, the original audience of Exodus chapter 19 and being Israel, the church is invited as Peter talks about that we pick up the vocation of Israel, representing God to a broken world through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So as people search for where God is, where is his dwelling, the the Bible says the story of dwelling would say that we who are in Christ are indeed God's dwelling place. And yet there's more. There is eschatological tension between the dwelling of God in us and where we will be in the future. Indeed, the end of scripture, the end of the story of dwelling closes with an actual physical place. New heavens and new earth, the city of God, the temple of God descended upon the earth. If you look at Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you get this amazing picture of something that looks a whole lot like the garden restored. But this time it's a city full of people who represent and are with the presence of God. Revelation 22, 4, they will see his face. Guys, we will be with God. And I believe the thing that God envisioned from the beginning the filling and multiplying, the proliferation of the image of God. That is what awaits us in the eschaton, that all of humanity embodied here on the new heavens and new earth when it arrives will indeed be with and represent God, dwelling with him forever. Mind blown. The shape of our hope through the lens of dwelling is that, guys, we will be living, dwelling with the living God in a real corporeal place. There will be a city that God puts on this earth and that we're going to live with him in. We who find our hope in Christ will be in that place. It seems like that place is coming here. So I hope this has been an encouraging look at the story of dwelling in the Bible as we sharpen our view of of the end, of our end game, the, the, the source of our hope. I hope that we can begin to be stirred to have a more comprehensive and weighty view of the living hope of the gospel. All right, guys, until next time, Godspeed. And guys, next week, we're going to go up in the helicopter again. We're going to look at the story, this one's a favorite of mine, of eating. Yep, that's a biblical theme that I think will actually help clarify our journey and our destination.